Once a year, finance ministers and central bank governors around the world gather in Washington, D.C. for a week to discuss the state of the global economy and its outlook. The occasion is known as the annual meetings of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. This year, there's really not much to celebrate at the event, as dark clouds are gathering on the horizon. Inflation, fiscal crisis, the war in Ukraine, slowing Chinese GDP growth are just some of the major headwinds, to name just a few. But not all country delegations bring bad news. The South Americans have the bragging rights this year, as their neck of the woods is one, albeit the only one, bright spot in the global economy. Brazil, a country with 200 million people and the ninth largest economy in the world, is doing rather well and better than expected. Indeed, its 2022 GDP growth forecast has just been revised up to 2.7% from 2%. Why is Brazil doing better? What does the upcoming presidential election mean for Brazil and the rest of the world? What does it mean for your money? Hi, I'm David Wu, a former Wall Street strategist with a 20-year track record of making actionable predictions about major global change. Welcome to The Money Game, where I take on groupthink, propaganda, and conspiracy theories in my critical analysis of markets, economics, and politics. Before we begin, please hit subscribe and the bell button so that you will be notified when a new video comes out. I'm in Washington, D.C. this week. In fact, we're right now sitting inside the Willer Hotel which I'm told is where the, uh, the January 6th protesters stayed the night before. We're a couple of blocks from the White House. There are a lot of meetings going around Washington right now. Traffic is terrible. But I have the great pleasure of being joined this morning by Danny Tannenbauser, a good friend of mine. Danny, you know, is the head of market strategy at Bank of New York Mellon. He, you know, obviously he overlooks the entire global markets, but he's also specially known for his expertise in emerging markets, in particular Brazil where he was born and grew up and knows extremely well. So Danny, thank you very much for joining me today. Talk about Latin America, talking about, you know, why the region is doing so well. So Danny, you know what, I know you've been in Washington now for, the, uh, for most of this week, going to a lot of meetings, meeting a lot of people. What are you hearing in the corridor about the concerns about the global economy? What, what invest, what's the investment sentiment? How would you characterize it right now? Negative. Right. I mean, I think that, uh, and, and we we spoke about this before. I mean, I think I think uh, uh, generally speaking, there is a, a, a sense of bearishness uh, that is coming from the many different perspectives, but uh, largely because investors are beaten when it comes to uh, when it comes to markets in general. Right. I mean, uh, it's very difficult to find something that is up on the year, right? And, uh, and the, the, the bonds are down and equities are down and there are markdowns when it comes to uh, uh, private equity uh, books and so on and so forth. So that's uh, the, ones, the one feedback that we're getting very, very clear. Um, the second one, which I found really interesting, I, I, f I thought that we're a lot closer to an end of the war in Ukraine. And it does feel like uh, we might drag into uh, 2023. The light at the end of the tunnel is Latin America, right? Uh, LATAM is really uh, where uh, uh, th th there is a little bit of a sweet spot there, uh, particularly when it comes to the macro backdrop in Brazil and Mexico. Brazil is doing very well. I mean, its economic growth forecast has been revised up this year. I mean, it's interesting because only six months ago it felt very different. A lot of people came to 2022 feeling actually not that great about Brazil. So it's turned around, caught a lot of people by surprise to a great extent. I mean, its currency has been the best performing currency. I mean, the world actually, despite a strong dollar, the Brazilian real is up a lot. So how do you account for the turnaround story in Brazil this year? So just to get the only thing that provide you that is liquid enough, large enough that provide you meaningful returns if you sold dollars to buy that is the Brazilian hell, right? So if, if you sold dollars to buy anything else, bonds, equities, any, pretty much any currency, gold, you would be underwater largely, right? Uh, and and Br Brazil is basically on the two digits. So basically it's like a 20, 25%, depending on what you did with your, your Brazilian hell, right? So, so it's, it's really, really a currency that did extremely well, right? Uh, so far this year. Our view has always been that the reopening in emerging markets is a lot more important to the activity and demand picture than in the developed world, right? And, and super basic stuff, right? Uh, a, a lot of the economy 
is not recorded. You don't see it, right? And it needs to happen in corners that are not necessarily recorded. So, and, and they require people leaving their homes to do that, right? I mean, all you need to do is just go to an emerging market and you see, right? Walk the streets and you see what I mean, right? Um, so the reopening is extremely important, right? And you, you, we talked about that on China, right? I mean, the reopening of China will be, ext and it's the event for 2023 if it happens, okay? Um, Brazil was ready to go heading into 2022, right? And that was the reason why I thought that the GDP estimates for this year were completely off mark, right? I mean, we started the year, everyone was calling for a negative growth this year. Uh, and the reason was they were, they were thinking the interest rates. They were like the central bank is hiking by a lot. There is a lot of there is a lot of constraints in the economy, right? You're heading into a, an election year, a lot of uncertainty. You're not going to see much activity. And they said, well, all of that will be overwhelmed by the reopening, right? And essentially, this is this is more or less what's materializing right now. There's also been the war, I mean, in Ukraine that has been sort of sent a sh negative shock away for most of the world. But I think, you know, a probably a case can be made that the war has been better for Brazil than for lots of other countries. You want to talk a little bit about the positive terms of trade shock? Yeah. Brazil is largely a closed economy, so it's not that you do have such a meaningful uh, portion of the economy that is that dependent on uh, 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 beneficial terms of trade. Having said that, it's the largest trade surplus against China outside Asia. Okay? So, uh, so in an environment where there is demand uh, or you know out of China, and this is like the basic stuff, right? Um, it's soybeans mostly, right? But then very, very quickly, it's expanding to pretty much everything else, right? Uh, when it comes to agriculture, it has an amazing uh, uh, developed um, agro business right it's it's really quite remarkable uh, what has happened in Brazil very very technologically advanced and it's it continues to improve so when it comes to all those things yes Brazil has benefited but a lot of it has to do with technology that Brazil continues to implement and improve over the years right. But what about energy? I mean, the energy shock has been a big story around the world, is, but for Brazil, it's been a positive. Would you say? I mean, yeah. In 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 uh, generally speaking, when it comes to most of Latin America, obviously Venezuela will be a different story once they they they, they kind of like get their act together. But but uh, elsewhere, it's it, they are usually self um, 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 sustained when it comes to energy. So basically, they are self sufficient. They are not net or energy exporters, right? I mean, they basically have the energy they need. When it comes to Brazil, it's probably, it's not probably, it's the single largest hydroelectric uh, powered economy in the world. Um, that's just one example. There's a lot of natural gas. Brazil also has nuclear uh, nuclear power, right? So uh, once you add all those things together, um, it's a very diversified yeah. backdrop, which is exactly what we need in an environment like this, so that you can juggle between different sources, right? Right. So in many ways, you, I, mean, our, I mean, Brazil seems to be very well positioned in a new right. brave, the brave new world, Correct. where like you know, it's, it, it, get up. That's exactly right. It's a closed economy, right? Yes. Which is the same, so you don't really need the trade to happen, right? It's a closed economy. Um, it's it's kind of protectionist, right? But but it's the world is going so it's almost like the world is converging toward Brazil than the other way around, right? It's quite protectionist, right? But that's fine because the world is turning more protectionist, and on top of it all, the macro policies have been quite beneficial. Right, um, and and there are there are probably uh, two things that I would like to highlight here. A is there are many issues against this administration, but th there is the one thing that I I don't believe that is being emphasized, which is the labor market reforms and the capital markets reforms that took place. Right, um, it's it's a lot easier to hire today in Brazil, a lot easier to hire than it was. 10 years ago. Into fire too, probably, right? I mean. Yes, that's correct. But again, you can, you know, it's, it's, so what happens, remember that I mentioned that you go to an emerging market, you see what's going on. That shadow economy, because it, 
it starts to dwindle, right? And and then all of a sudden they come back. So this is this is essentially actually a positive thing because they come into the job market. Then they need to open a bank account. They open a bank account. They understand what is savings, and then they start putting money aside. So all of that works in a way. I mean, fintech in Brazil is booming, right? Why is fintech in Brazil booming? Why is it so successful, right? Because. But- because again, they, they basically have, they get a job, they need to start, and then PIX. PIX is probably one of the most successful digital payment system that was launched by a central bank out there. So you do have all those things that are working that complement each other, right, and support. It's a lot easier to go bankrupt today in Brazil than it was 10 years ago. Going bankrupt in Brazil historically, has it's a nightmare, right? And all of a sudden, it's, it's a lot easier to actually go through that process. Those things are things that actually have helped the economy despite the fact that the central bank is now hiking interest rates a lot. So you're basically saying that, you know, what actually real interest rates are very attractive. So the real actually, despite its performance this year, there actually could be more upside. Investors are holding their breath, you know, in terms of the waiting for the outcome of the second round of the presidential election. I mean, in Brazil, which obviously could have, you know, huge, you know, impact on how Brazilian markets are going to perform for the rest of the year. You correctly predicted, you know, that the polls did not quite capture, you know, the support behind President Bolsonaro in the first round. And indeed, he came in, you know, in second place. But, you know, the gap between Lula in first place and Bolsonaro in second place was much smaller than what the polls were indicating before now. So let's talk a little bit about this because, you know, ironically, you think about this, if the economy is doing that well in Brazil, you would think that the incumbent was going to get a huge, basically, lift from the economy alone. I mean, don't the Brazilians see that their economy is doing a lot better, you know, than the rest of the world? And therefore, you know, they want to give some credit to their president, Bolsonaro. I know a lot of people, you know, you know, outside Brazil look upon, you know, Bolsonaro as a far right person. They call him the Brazilian Trump, you know, in a derogatory way. And but what's the reality here? Why aren't Brazilians giving enough credit to their president who seems to have delivered his promises in the country's in a good place right now. Right. I mean, the, the, by the way, every, every time we start talking about these things, I mean, the pushback that I get, well, we're doing well despite Bolsonaro. <laughs> you can't win, right? You just can't win. But, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, um, it's, it's widely known in Latin America that there is, you need to make some sort of transfers, right? Uh, to basically try to shrink the social disparities that you have across the country, right? Um, and I think I think that heading into the the, the 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 first round, the narrative started to turn, right? Oh, this is going to be Lula. Lula might even win in the first round. But again, if you look into, there was a very large cohort of voters that no one really knew where they stood, right? And heading into it, then we saw all of a sudden Bolsonaro. They all voted for Bolsonaro. Now. Um, the narrative on the other side of it, and this is why I think that the Bulls are going to get wrong in the second round as well, right? Is that, um, oh, Bolsonaro, Bolsonaristas refused to answer, right? That, that's why they, we didn't capture the vote of Bolsonaro voters because they just, they are, they, they basically said, I refuse to collaborate with a regime, i.e. the posters, that basically has an intrinsic left-leaning bias, right? So by me collaborating with them, I'm actually supporting the other side. I mean, I mean a lot of people are talking about the fact that, you know what, uh, the percentage of the Brazilian populations who are evangelical Christians has gone up basically 200% over the last decade from like 10% to now 30% of the population. And this is consistent with the fact that according to polls, 70% of Brazilians are against, you know, legalized abortions. I mean, obviously this is playing basically into, you know, Bolsonaro's more conservative agenda. I mean, to what extent do you think this election is going to come down to these social and basically cultural, you know, basically divide between the left and the right as opposed to the economy? Well, I mean, look, Lula is speaking to the to the evangelicals as well. I mean, there isn't a day that I don't see a headline of Lula actually speaking to that cohort too, right? So, um, so I think that... Um, it's, I agree with you. It's an important slice of the electorate, but I think that uh, it, it's it's being addressed by both ends. I couldn't really uh, nail whether 
it's going to be a, a very clear and clean win, right? Uh, in my opinion, is more about the center. It really is. In many ways, I mean, it, you know, it, it, it feels like this election in Brazil, it feels that it's a lot like the U.S. election in 2020 between Trump and basically Biden, right? I mean, under Trump, the U.S. economy did well. However, a lot of people didn't give him credit for what he did. Okay, they call him far right. And, you know, they call him um, populist, you know, nationalist and whatever name they gave him. And then it was a very close contest where Trump lost by whatever, 40,000 basically votes. Mm -hmm. I mean, to what extent do you think, I mean, again, I'm trying to understand yeah, the similarity yeah. between Bolsonaro and Trump. And, and what is the fascination of the Brazilian public with, you know, with, you know, with, with, with Bolsonaro. To what extent, you know, Brazil, like there's the U.S. has become highly way, polarized. There's, you know? there's fascination with both candidates, right? Yeah. I mean, let, let me, like, you know, yeah. there is, uh, Lula is, uh, represents um, a, a Brazilian success story, right? That, um, th th that, that's why he is what he is. Right? So there is a lot of that in both ends, right? But I also believe that um, when it comes to the advisors, to Bolsonaro, right? They're they're learning. So as they say, right? I mean, history never repeats itself, but it does rhyme. Um, so this is a classic example for that, right? I mean, you do that. There is a there is a, a cohort of people underneath Bolsonaro that sees what happened back then right? in the U.S. You know, uh, in the U.S. Yes. right? And he's saying, I cannot begin to explain how different the result of the first round was. Again, forget about the actual president. If you actually go into the granularity of the results, the polls were completely wrong in so many different perspectives, right? The, the way Bolsonaro won in the state of Rio de Janeiro is quite, and this is a state that has a history of being left-leaning, okay? Th this is the state that earns all the oil royalties in Brazil. So basically, it's a lot of the oil stuff is the state of Rio, right? And yet, basically you 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 went on towards uh, the bolsonaro end right so so there were things there that happened that are very different than what the posters were predicting bolsonaro you know he's got some economic achievement under his belt right but at the same time he does definitely represent conservative values and so on and so forth if you know he did better than expected in the first round which of these two parts of him you think was the main appeal for people who supported him? Uh, there is a part of almost any Brazilian, almost any Brazilian, that really wants the country to be straightened out, right? From the very different perspectives, right? When it comes to policies, when it comes to... Um, a bureaucracy to have basically bureaucrats, proper bureaucrats running the country and so on. And I think that at the end of the day, so Bolsonaro did manage, right, to portray an environment where essentially things are looking uh, more orderly now than they did, you know, before Temer. I mean, almost any Brazilian will tell you that actually probably the best president in Brazilian history is actually Temer, right? That's uh, the one that took over after the impeachment of Dilma. Um, because so many things happened in two years, right? It was, it was really very active and a lot of really, really strong legislation was approved during those two years. But what Bolsonaro did when coming in, he just continued that, right? Um, and I think that uh, there is a group of Brazilian that once uh, they actually come... Do, do I really want to take the risk of giving my vote to the other side? Just five years ago, you know, we had all these, you know, this new crop of politicians that are known as, you know, sort of uh, populist right-wing politicians, you know, that came into power. It was Trump, there was Modi in India, there was Abe in Japan, there was uh, Boris Johnson in the UK, and of course there was Bolsonaro, right? Johnson is now gone, you know, Trump is now out. You know, Abe is, you know, is out. Modi is still going strong. I mean, so from that point of view, all of a sudden there's only Bolsonaro and Modi. I mean, what do you think? This is why in some sense, like, you know, the question about this election in Brazil, is this brand of politics, you know, basically viable in this current environment? So, so my answer to you is super simple. It is as long as you cater the center. 
right? I think that uh, uh, steering towards your core, right, in my opinion, will not work, right? And I think that was probably the strategic mistake that happened here in the U.S. with Trump team, right? Is that um, uh, that and and you know you, you need to have a long term view of things, right? right. Um, and that that also why I think that you know people are talking about uh, midterm elections that on the other side we might have we talked about this that there will be a, like a red wave and as a result of that red wave we might actually see investigations against Hunter Biden and so on and so forth. I I, I, I kind of like I buy into that narrative. I think it's probably going to materialize. Um, I, I'm just not sure that that's the direction of travel that uh, Trump should actually go if indeed he wants to run and win the next elections, yeah. right? And I think that, um, the, you know, when it comes to Bolsonaro, again, the reason why the results were the results is because he has been converging to the center, right? He has been trying to cater for a group of voters that want the anchor that yeah. Brazil has provided them over the past few years. Right. That's very interesting. So, because would you say, I mean, as a starting point, though, would you say that Brazil itself is as polarized as the US, right? If you think about like income inequality, it's even more extreme in Brazil than in the US. You know, if you think about possibly racism, political correctness, and all these things, right? Brazil has basically the socialist, basically, uh, you know, basically background. And in, in the 21st century, they're trying to basically chart new course towards basically new capitalism. So from that point of view, like that's interesting because the Ideologically, I imagine Brazil is as polarized as the U.S., Correct. but you're saying that actually, you know, Bolsonaro's success, at least up to now, is that he managed to, to basically cater to his, basically, ideological supporters, but at the same time, he has not given up the center ground, and that has been his success so far. And we'll find out very soon whether this is actually going to pay off in the second round. Yes. Bolsonaro is the Brazilian flag. Right. So basically, it's like if you identify yourself with the Brazilian flag, you are somehow immediately seen as a Bolsonarista. Right. Whereas if you are with Lula, you wrap yourself with a red flag. Right. <laughs> right. And it's like, in, in my opinion, that in itself already is, is, is begging for a strategic mistake from Lula's group group right because i mean you you immediately say you know one second like you know I, so why I, I don't want to be proud of my country or of where i live it's interesting because i think people want to be proud of their country i mean yeah. I, I you know and then somehow the left doesn't quite get it you well know? that is true but again you know i think the u.s is still a point outside the curve the, the, the united states still that's why biden ended up managing to make it right because you you the u.s still is a country that both parties will embrace embrace patriotism in different ways right yeah. U.S. has always had a tenuous relationship with the rest of the world. I think, you know, it was Kissinger who said this, you know, if you're enemy of the U.S., you're in trouble. But if you're a friend, you're even a bigger trouble. <laughs> now, obviously, you know, if you think about Bolsonaro, he was very close to Trump, right? And he, uh, he also visited, you know, Putin a, a week before Putin basically invaded Ukraine. But at the same time, Lula has been, you know, on record saying that he thought that Putin was provoke into invading Ukraine by the U.S., you know, the whole issue around, you know, U.S. insistence of NATO enlargement, so on and so forth. So it, it would seem, I mean, do you think it's going to make a difference, whether it's Bolsonaro or Lula, in terms of the relationship with the U.S., or certainly vis-a-vis -vis the whole, you know, rivalry between the U.S. and China and Russia at this moment? Right. This administration has not been able to mend or improve this is U.S. administration, its relationships with Latin America, period, okay? Uh, and, and I'm saying this with a very, very heavy heart, right? Because um, the opportunities for the United States, just looking south, are immense, right? When it comes to uh, um, reshoring, right? I mean, you, you need Mexico, and this is, you know, it's amazing how it's working and how fast it's working, right? Um, in terms of like tourism, I mean, you don't need, I mean, you fly overnight and you literally can go into, in my opinion, the most beautiful country in the world, right? Which is Brazil, 
all you need is an overnight flight, no jet lag, no nothing, right? And and uh, just as two examples, right? And um, and yet, right? You spend so much more effort elsewhere, right? And and I think that when it comes to that, it reflects in both on Bolsonaro and Lula as well, and that's why I don't think that foreign relations is something that is that high up in the agenda and because of the u.s you think that they oh, feel yeah. like you know they feel like you know they're beating against basically their closed door the u.s is not interested in latin america even though it's the u.s neighbor like why is that why do you think you know washington under basically biden has been so reluctant to embrace latin america especially as it takes on basically asia china and russia and elsewhere well there, 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 there are probably three reasons reason number one is um, is uh, governance and transparency, right? I mean, uh, Anglo-Saxons are very transparent, right? I mean, governance is like, and, and dealing with Latin America, are dealing with a very different mindset. The US still sees itself as a global power. Right? The global power. <laughs> exactly. The, a, it yeah, depends. I mean, I don't know for how many more years, but it, it sees itself as, and the question is, again, to keep that status, I mean, do the, does the U.S. really need Latin America, right? I mean, it's like, you know, maybe, maybe I can just keep them, you know, and then deal with all the other issues around the world. So that's point number two. Uh, point number three is that... Um, uh, it's, it's Latin America, aside from Mexico, but even Mexico, I mean, it's, it's very protectionist. I mean, even though, yes, there are free trade agreement negotiations going on, but it's always like it's patchy, it's a touch and go kind of thing. It's not, it's not straightforward. Yeah. What about relationships? So you don't see a huge, you know, basically a transformation in terms of the Brazil-U.S. relationship. Just, you know, re, you know, regardless who wins the uh, the second round in uh, in Brazil. But what about the relationship with China? I mean, obviously, China is a major, major, largest export market for basically Brazil. I mean, do you think if Brazil having to choose between China and the U.S., which way do you think Brazil will go in the end? Because clearly, you know, countries are now facing the stark choice of having to choose one over the other. If if you really need to go there, it will be the U.S. I think. Yeah. Okay. And the reason is, uh, at the end of the day, is democracy, right? So even if you go through many of the PT supporters, which is the vast majority of my friends down in Rio, um, and you ask them, they say, look, if I was to pick between a, a, a dictatorship and a democracy, I would always pick a democracy, right? So uh, that, that even though I believe that the Chinese model, and here I'm quoting, even though I believe the Chinese model has many, many, many benefits, right, that should be adopted in different ways, um, it's, it's still, I want my country to be a democracy. And why? Because, you know, I don't want to go back to the 80s or the 70s or the 60s, right? Right, right, right. So that, that is, this is a country that has, that has experienced dictatorship. Right. And I think that it's a very similar, if you go to Spaniards, if you go to Portuguese, it's, um, you, you're going to, I mean, the Italians, right? You're going to hear that from them as well, right? Is that they don't. Would you be putting your own money into Brazil right now? I mean. De definitely, definitely. I think that um, um, even under Lula, it's, it, it probably could be rocky at the beginning. It feels that it's, it's, there is a little bit more of um, room for doubt, right, from the market's perspective, right? And uh, as a result, given what happened in the first round, i.e. The, the, there is so much support underneath the surface to the center and the right in Congress, Senate, right? Um, uh, basically, Lula will try to toy around with more extreme. Right? So basically, I'm, I'm going to bring a minister of finance that is a little bit more left-leaning. I'm going to try to get things done early on. Um, one of the biggest, most powerful things about the Brazilian president is that the Brazilian president can nominate a lot of people beyond the cabinet, right? SOEs and so on and so forth. So he probably will deploy that, okay, to basically try to get as much of his own agenda 
slash ideology through early on. The markets will not like that. And the reason why it will be okay is because, again, you have the anchor of real interest rates, right? So that's why I think that even in an environment with Lula, you're going to have a great opportunity. To so would you say like one strategy is, let's say you're going to basically invest $100 in Brazil. You basically, you know, maybe invest 50% before the election, Correct. let's just say now. And then the other 50%, you know, you basically uh, wait until what you what happens in the election. If it's going to be a Lula win, you wait basically uh, for a week before you deploy that cash. If it's you might, you might need to wait a little, yeah, you might need to wait a little bit longer just because again, the, the, there is going to be cabinet formation and so on. Sure. Again, the new president only starts next year, so basically right. there there is a there, there, you you will have time. Um, so you, you probably could gradually go in or you do like 40 and then within the 60, you'll do 20, 20, 20, something like that. But yes, I mean, the, the call would be a bias long okay. uh, and uh, and then basically uh, on the other side of it. Also, I mean, Bolsonaro might also decide on a different cabinet as well. So it will be interesting to see what he br okay. brings in, right? Macro investors have done very well in 2022 Correct. so far. If you look at macro hedge fund as a community, you know, they're up somewhere between 20 and 30 percent mm -hmm. year to date, which is like the best year they've had in 10 years, that's, as far as I can remember. Yes. Do you think, why do you think they're doing so well? And do you think this is sustainable, you know, basically going forward? It, they are the liquidity providers, right? And the market needs liquidity right now. Just by looking into, you know, a super simple uh, spread analysis in the U.S. Treasury market, which is by far the most liquid, largest bond market in the world, um, you are actually at the pretty illiquid backdrop, as, as illiquid as we were during the Great Lockdown. Right. AMLO, you know, the president of Mexico, who is definitely coming from the left, very much to the left, got along much better with Trump than he seems to be getting along with Biden, which is kind of odd. Because you could argue that Trump and AMLO, two people, cannot be any more different. Yet Trump somehow managed to basically build a relationship with AMLO, which actually helped strengthen the U.S.-Mexico relationship that helped basically make it happen, the renegotiation of NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. I mean, where do you think Mexico is now? I think vis-a-vis -vis the U.S., you know, Mexico is also doing better than expected. You know, do you think that the Mexican story is uh, something that investors should be paying attention to as well. Right. I mean, A, yes. So let's start from the end. I think that Mexico is probably as attractive, if not even more attractive in different pockets, right? I mean, Brazil is just a high real interest rate story, whereas in Mexico, you have so much more given the reshoring and so on. Following four years of, of basically studying the AMLO administration much more closely, I learned that there are different pockets of of thought process within AMLO and his administration. Okay, um, there is the way he thinks about energy and natural resources of Mexico, which in his head are for the Mexicans, so to speak. Right. So you know the gringos should not be basically telling us what to do with our own treasures. Right. Um, and then uh, there is the rest, business kind of thing, which is uh, um, uh, the goods, right? So, you know, auto manufacturing, uh, TV screens, and so on and so forth. So the, again, the reshoring out of Asia into, into Mexico, right? And the tourism, which is massive, right? Um, and, and when it comes to that second part, the administration and AMLO, they are much more pragmatic, right? And this is why it, it, it feels uh, that all that part will not be challenged. So as a result, like for instance, if I go with my phone today to Mexico, my, my US phone, it works there and it's the same bill. It's like, I, it's a, you have basically, a, a, my package is essentially Mexico, US and Canada. Now, when you think about it, people, yeah, it's only three countries, but this is like the largest economic block in the planet. I mean, this is like a massive, and you basically can just go with your phone. You can watch Netflix in those, but you can just do anything, right? Think about it, right? Even within Europe, you have challenges if you go from Germany to France in some cases, right? And yet here you have this massive population, right? 
um, that we're talking about. Again, we're talking here about almost half a million people, right? That essentially have basically access and free trading services. And I think this is something that AMLO respects. But what is interesting with all of that, you know, thank you so much for joining me today. To me, I mean, the biggest takeaway is if you look at someone like AMLO in Bolsonaro, they cannot be any more different, right? I mean, Bolsonaro is basically this, you know, right-wing nationalist, but in the end, despite his ideological commitment, he was a pragmatist, right? He's now catering to the center. That's why he did better than expected in the first round. We'll see if that pays off for him in the second round, but up to now, we could argue his accomplishments mainly reflect, reflect less his ideology and reflects much more his pragmatic approach to basically policy and getting things done. The same thing with AMLO, who comes from the other side of the spectrum in terms of his politics, a leftist, the market was in fear of him when he first took power, but he, ironically, a little bit like Trump, turned out to be a businessman, at least when it comes to you know, the non-energy sector of the economy for which he's been able to implement good changes. So I think this is something very important because I look around the world, I see that increasingly politicians seem to be motivated by their ideological belief, like what we're seeing right now in the UK under trust. She wants to be Thatcher, it's like almost blinded, basically her in terms of what is the more pragmatic things to do. And as a result, I think, you know, Europe is floundering, lots of other places as well, because of this not being able to basically pick between ideology and pragmatism. And it's great to hear that at least in Latin America, pragmatism seems to be winning the day. And that's why Latin America is doing better. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree 100%. I agree 100%. And again, real interest rates play out a a very important role here. Uh, Mexico just managed to raise interest rates above where headline inflation is printing. Inflation still is looking topish. Not like Brazil that already has turned the corner and we're seeing pretty dramatic drops in the headline. Um, but you, because you have that interest rate anchor, that helps out a lot, right? And yes. if I was to actually pick that model and look elsewhere, again, look at Europe, right? I mean, reference rates at 75 basis points with headline at 10%. I mean, mm-hmm. it's like there is no anchor here, right? With the fiscal pumping in, right? Sure. So basically you need you, 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 you need those things to re-anchor and the dollar will only start to depreciate again once the other side of the equation starts uh, putting its act together and re-anchoring uh, the policy mix. Great. Thank you so much, Danny. This has been extremely basically uh, enlightening and then I'm sure our audience really appreciate it. That's so, awesome. Thank, thank you for having me.